So I, I have a, um, I have a uh, visual aid to kind of start this service or the sermon. I'll be right back. <laughs> I need two guys who would come and help me um, with this. It, it, I say guys, but it could be a, a lady too. You want to help me up here? Okay, I need one more. Okay, Ken, come on. <laughs> we'll see how this works. So, so for right now, if you just kind of put a hand on it here, and, and then I'm going to ask you to lift it, but not, not yet. So I've kind of told this story before um, a, a while back, quite a while back. There was an Easter program at Spokane First Church of the Nazarene. And in it, uh, it's going to have to do with the, uh, the scripture we see up there, the passage, John chapter 20, verse 24 through 29. It's that scripture where, where Jesus um, stands up in the middle of the room and says, peace be with you. You remember that? The doors are locked and everything. We're going to read the scripture in just a second. But in this, I thought this would be fun to just relive something. But in this illustration, um, we had set it up. It was, uh, it was a presentation of that scene. And what was supposed to happen is the choir is like seated out here. And uh, um, at the time that Jesus comes in, the choir is singing some songs of lament because Jesus has gone away. And then in the middle of their, their songs of lament, and I don't remember what it was at that time, they're supposed to be on the set. So this would be like back there where it says Hillside International Church of the Nazarene. There were these windows because it was a gathering place. And, and what's supposed to happen is some of the bigger, broader, male, particularly guys who could block this window would come and stand in front of it so Jesus could sneak through the window Okay, and then come down into the middle of the choir while everybody is standing and singing the lament. And then he steps up and goes, peace be with you. And they all go, ah, how did he do that? But instead, um, the guys, the guys uh, that were supposed to stand in front of the window. Now you can lift it up if you would, but you're going to have to hold it. Not that high. <laughs> right about there. That's about perfect. Okay. So instead, there's nobody standing there. So this is what the audience saw that day. Pretend I'm the Jesus guy. crawling through. It was that awkward. I'm not kidding because uh, thank you very much. Let's let these guys know that we appreciate the help. <laughs> so the dramatic peace be with you moment kind of was like not so much, right? It ended up being more of a, why is that guy crawling in through the window uh, moment rather than something big and miraculous? So turn in your Bibles, though, to that portion of Scripture, John chapter 20. Now you're going to have that image in your head while we're reading through this, I know. Jesus being stuck with, and he, and he really did because he had this garment that went all the way down, you know, the Jesus robe. So he, it was like stuck on the window as he was pulling it through. Let's stand together. John chapter 20, verses 24 through 29. And read this. Do we have that? I can't remember if we got, there we go. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. Let's read it all together, so follow out loud. You don't have to look down, and you can follow here if you would like. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were, put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them, though the doors were locked. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. And then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen 
and yet have believed. Would you bow your head with me? Uh, rather than me pray, I would like it if, if a couple people we were just following pray along. Out. Because I told you that we were going to do some things here on Sunday mornings that were not exactly step by step with what we're talking about on Wednesdays, but it's close. And so I, if I was in that, uh, this would be session four, and the title of it would be Scars. And, and the story as we've gone through these weeks, it, it goes like this. It starts off with the story. And the idea, just very quick summary, the idea that there is God's story and our story and his idea has been all along that our story would be part of his story. He would use our story of life, the pictures that were drawn for me to become part of his expression. Uh, like we're epistles in the gospel. Does that make sense? That's what he wants is that our story is brought into his. And then we talked about the temple and the idea very quickly that the temple, we, we just started this last week, and the idea that a pursuing Yahweh makes his temple uh, drawing closer and closer and closer till the Holy Spirit or the temple of God, we're told in the scripture, resides in us. And then the third one is the dialogue uh, about kingdom. And then this one, and, and what does it mean to be a kingdom citizen? And when is the kingdom arrive? And, and in some capacities, there is this uh, heavenly kingdom that is, that is in the near coming aspect uh, as we pass from this earth. But there is also a present kingdom that Jesus has offered us that is in the here and now. Amen. And so today what we're talking about then is, is scars. And I'm going to try to, that, that's how he describes it. He, Jefferson Bethke, in that story. But the reason that I gave, well, I hope it'll come and make sense. I kind of took that idea and, and went a little bit different direction, but it's still in line with that. And the title that we have, bringing it all back together, bringing the, the pieces of our life, bringing all of these things that we, we can't really understand sometimes why they happened back together, but also bringing me, reconciling me, my spirit, my heart with God's spirit, with God's heart, bringing that brokenness back together. So in that scripture we just read about Thomas and Jesus and this interaction, I want to bring out a few points there. If you were going to take those verses and just kind of say, well, what is this message about? Is it about belief? And, uh, and I know sometimes when the speaker says something like that, you're like, well, is that a trick question? Because it is about belief, right? It's, 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 uh, it's about belief, but it's also about more than that. There's something more that is happening, and it's happening with Thomas uh, in, a, in a different way than it has happened with the rest of those people who are gathered together. Because Thomas is broken. And Thomas is separated still in a way that the rest of the group there is not. I mean, think about this. Go, go back. If you have your Bible still open there, John chapter 20. And it tells us Thomas was not with the disciples. That's a, it, don't you hate it when you come into a room and <laughs> at church or you miss the thing that happened at the retreat or the Bible study. And, and there's several people talking about how cool it is. And you're like, I mean, basically what we say is, and they're all saying, we have seen the Lord. And we're like, yeah, well, it didn't happen for me. I wasn't there. So I don't know what you're talking about. And that's why I'm saying Thomas is, is broken. And he, he goes beyond that. I mean, they greet him, verse 26 or 25. So that other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. And he says to them, uh-uh. Basically, his response is, you're not dragging me back into that whole thing. Unless I have my own personal experience, I ain't going back there. I'm not with you guys in this. 
So I wrote down some notes just for me here. It was like, does, does he struggle with Jesus not being Jesus? And I think the answer to that in most ways is no. But what he's struggling, in other words, he still believes that this guy that he has followed has been all these things. There's this rational kind of thing. But in his heart, because of everything that has happened, he is emotionally disconnected. And he says, well, that's, that's great for you guys. But not for me. And so he's suffering with his own sense of lostness while he's surrounded by a bunch of people who are all happy and whole. Have you ever been there? Thomas is basically, I think, trying to say, you know, I'm, I'm laying this line down and I'm going to stay where I'm at unless, right? I have already kind of made a decision. I'm one of these walking wounded and all of you cheerleaders for Jesus are not going to change that. That's over for me. <laughs> and I think he pro what he says probably is, is something that maybe spills out like this will never happen. But unless he comes and he lets me do this and this and I can touch him here and here. I, the, last, the last statement, last sentence of what he says, I will not believe. So unless Jesus makes a point to work it out with me and my personal brokenness, uh-uh. So here's this, here's this amazing story of a Jesus who meets Thomas' request, or demand, almost. See, I think that there's things that there is not enough glue in all the world for us to humanly fix. You believe that? I have an image that came up. I, I just Googled shattered or, or something. I don't remember. But there was a picture of a person. There you go. Of a, of a broken, shattered person. And there's not enough glue in all the world to humanly repair what is happening with Thomas. What happens with us in that separation. In fact, what happened with the whole world in Genesis 4, the, the fall, there's not enough glue for us to humanly fix, not ourselves or anybody else. That's where Thomas is at, unless Jesus. Uh, two points here that are not on your outline, but I think they're worthwhile things to say. Jesus is not afraid of our wounds. In other words, there is no disconnect, there is no separation, there is no woundedness that you are experiencing that Jesus goes, oh my, I don't know what to do with that. I've never seen anything like that. He is not afraid of your wounds, but he would rather see scars in their place. He would rather see a healing and the reason is, and this is how Jefferson Bethke kind of unpacks this, is scars tell a story. They're wounds that have been healed. Scars tell a story. How many people have spiritual scars that only Jesus healed in your life today? I hope it's everybody. Because the truth is, is we were all wounded, all separated, whatever. We all have mess. We're going to get to that even more in, in regard to Scripture in just a second. But those things represent wounds that have been healed. Doesn't mean that they did not exist. It just means that he has come and he has healed those, those situations in our life and brought us into right relationship. Second thing, and again, these two points weren't in your outline. The first one, Jesus is not afraid of our wounds. The second one is Jesus meets us at the point of our woundedness. He does come to us. Now, it may not be the literal sense in which, what we just read here in John chapter 20. 
But Jesus will meet you at that point of your brokenness, at that point of your separation, at the point of your wound. One thing that we discovered in talking about this in our Sunday school classes, we have to move away from this being a physical deal because sometimes we, we hold out this idea that if, if God really loves me, he will heal every physical pain. Now, I'm not going to say because we absolutely believe in a God that heals physical issues too. But what I also believe is that sometimes our holding out for physical healing is, is a distraction from the wholeness, from the complete healing that God wants to bring into our lives. It's like squirrel. And we miss the eternal connectedness, the eternal healing that God wants to bring to us because we get too caught up with physical stuff. That doesn't mean that we don't pray for physical healing because God does that. Amen? How many know this in your immediate family? Say amen. amen. So we know that, but can you also understand that in this, the, the woundedness that separates, that causes chasm, this, this separation that we see right out front between Thomas and all the rest of these people, how many also know that God wants to really heal that every bit, in fact, more so than just the physical stuff? If so, say amen. amen. So he meets us at that point of our woundedness, at the point of our mess. Now back to some uh, things that are, are on your outline here. The first one is this. We are all wounded in this capacity. We are all wounded in this capacity. Luke chapter 5, verses 31 and 32 say this. Jesus answered them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but who? I have not come to call the righteous, but who? Sinners to repentance. That is for this kind of healing. I have come into this church. I have come into your fellowship. I have come into your house to bridge the gap, that place where there was not healing, and bring us back together as God's family. And then Romans 3.23, even more succinct in regard to who? Say this. Let's say this one out loud. We've all heard this, or most of us together. Ready? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So if we say we do not have a wounded situation ever in our spiritual past, we're wrong. All have sinned. So there is this separation. Again, think of, think of Thomas. Back to this story, the literal thing we just read a few moments ago. It is such a hard place to be where Thomas was in that moment. But we're all there. We are all at that place at one time or another. And if you think I haven't gotten there yet, you will. Where you realize there is a healing that God wants to give you. Maybe you're here for the first time ever at Hillside Church or in a church. If you are, welcome. Man, I'm so glad you're here. And if you are not at the place, it was so good to hear what Sean Rael had to say, that there are active, uh, dynamic powers that are pulling her away from what she knows she needs. And she just said, but somehow I, I, I'm realizing right now, and, and, I, it was, and, and she drew that picture, I'm realizing right now that there has also been this tug from God, and I need to be here. And so now I am here, and I'm so glad. I'm so glad, but that stuck in between place stinks. See, one of the things you have to, if you look at the, that portion of scripture too, um, there is, uh, go back with me. I'll, so the disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. And he said, he gives his negative reaction. And then between verse 25 and 26, how much time elapses? A week. So Thomas is living in that place. Yeah, you guys are all nuts. <laughs> I'm the only one who is living in reality. And my reality is painful and horrible and stinky. And I don't like it, but it's still reality. And I'm hanging on to it. Because it's mine. <laughs> don't tell me I have a bad attitude. My wife told me that. And now I sleep on the couch. 
I don't know how that got in there. That's not in the notes. <laughs> I just heard rumors about that from somebody else's house. <laughs> I got to dig back in again here somehow. <laughs> For a week, Thomas is the lone voice saying, uh uh. <laughs> Let's take it out of that context for just a minute and, and kind of make it more general. I mean, because I can hear Thomas's words um, and basically. It sounds like, not if I move it from that context, it sounds like when we get to that place where we say things like this, I can do this by myself, will you just leave me alone? And a week goes by. And what's funny is people generally, when we're that adamant, they do leave us alone, don't they? Until we get to that place where instead of saying, I can do this, leave me alone, it, it comes out like this. I have no idea how to do this, please rescue me. Right? So in that week, uh, just to dig in for a second here, what lives in our hearts? In that week, I can do this, leave me alone. Before I get to that other place, what lives in my heart? A lot, right? Confusion. Hurt. Shame. I've made this stand. And you are not going to push me out of here. I am making a stand. Like I said, it's the stand of reality. And so I'm staying here. You can't push me out of here. And if you've ever worked with somebody who is in that place, even sometimes as confident and angry as they sound, the motivation behind that confidence or just below the surface of that is shame. Man, that's one of the most difficult things to move people out of. We kind of get, we kind of get warm and cozy in this out front. I am here. And inside, we're ashamed of ourselves because we will not let go and be restored. We, we focus on self-reliance. I don't need him. I don't need anybody. I'm fine. I can do this. I have no idea how to do this. Will somebody please rescue me? Dreadful week for Thomas at the lease. And then Jesus walks in. As we've already seen, and he steps into the crowd through the window, and, uh, well, no, he steps into the crowd, <laughs> into their midst through locked doors and windows, and to everybody, he announces what? Peace be with you. That's for everyone. And then he turns to Thomas, verse 26. He turns his attention, put your finger here, almost like he knew exactly what Thomas wanted. See, when we read the scriptures sometimes, we kind of go, well, yeah, that's what Thomas, but almost, I mean, are we missing the understanding here that when we are in that place, in the middle, doing all this stuff to kind of make our place comfortable, that Jesus knows exactly what our thoughts have been? I mean, that's, that's worth singing about, isn't it? How great is our God? That even in my, ugh, he still knows exactly 
what's happening and what I'm thinking and what I'm doing. He says, at this point to Thomas only, come here. See my scars. Touch me and believe. And What's interesting is Thomas didn't even have to say, please rescue me. Jesus just knew he needed rescuing. Aren't you thankful for that too? <laughs> and so he does it anyway. He grabs, I thought of it this way. It's like he grabs hold of the bicycle seat of our life and peace is restored. <laughs> We're about ready to crash. So why? How, how is it that he's able to do that? Because Jesus gets it. Jesus understands us. Luke 19.41. I'm going to have to hurry here. Luke 19.41. This is from, uh, I think it's the English Standard Version Bible. It says, and when he drew near and he saw the city, he wept over it. And, and then there's another verse that I wanted to show you. A, a pair, uh, section of scripture here. John chapter 11, verses 33 through 36. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus, shortest verse in the Bible, right? Is what? Jesus wept. And so the Jews said, see how he what? Two separate portions of scripture, but they both focus on the same thing. Here is God incarnate, God in man, and he does what? He cries. Because he understands the human condition, because that is part of who he is. And so we, well, we'll read further in just a second. This is, this is why he gets it. And we see it here. Those are some of the most impressive portions of Scripture to me that there are. Because we, we see God in the flesh, part of the Trinity, who cries. He cries in that first Scripture when he looks over this entire city. And you know what he sees? Think about it. He sees this whole city that is a mess, that is broken, that is wounded, that needs reconciliation. And he looks at that city and he does not say, I am sending fire because you are a mess. I will never come down to meet with you. Instead, he looks at that city and he cries because he understands the human part. My voice cracked there a little bit. <laughs> Second puberty or something, I don't know. And then he cries at a family funeral that doesn't turn out to be one. And the other people look at him and they're like, isn't he Messiah? He, he cried. Last thing, and he is the only answer. He is the only answer. We, we can try many options. But the reason behind this that, that, that I would submit to you today that he is the only answer is that not only does he see and, or I'm sorry, not only does he feel as we do, but he also hurts and suffers like we do. As a representation, we've already kind of stepped into this of how God became a man. Philippians 2, 5 through 8. God became a man. Here's the scripture. I, I know I'm skipping a little bit there, Janelle. In your relationships with one another, this is Paul writing, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. I, I've read this at Christmas time before. Who being in the very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even how? Death on a cross. I underlined some portions uh, in my notes of that because this God became man thing is so huge for us to grasp because the whole thing here, the whole idea is us meeting Jesus. That's why the church, we talked about reconciliation, but that's us meeting Jesus, us sharing with others how they can meet Jesus. 
But Jesus, who being in the very nature God, made himself nothing, made in human likeness, humbled himself, and became obedient. Which takes us to the next uh, portion of scripture and point in your outline. Jesus is the perfect man. Romans 5.19. He is the perfect man. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, who was who? Adam. The many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, who is Jesus, many will be made righteous. So he is the perfect the perfect man. He is also the perfect priest. And this is where we get to again this idea. He weeps. Jesus is the perfect priest. Hebrews chapter 4 verses 14 through 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest, who are we talking about? Who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess. I love these verses. I Verse 15, chapter 4, Hebrews. We do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. And yet what? Did not sin. So therefore, let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. He will rescue us. He will rescue you. He, he's rescued me so many times, I should just have one of those white things around my waist. All the time. Ev, <laughs> why do you react that way? Here is a life preserver, you idiot. He doesn't say idiot, though. I never find that. I'm going to rescue you. And lastly, he's the perfect sacrifice. John 1, 29. And the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and he said, look, what? The Lamb of God. The Lamb represents what? Sacrifice, right? The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So he's the perfect man, the perfect priest, the perfect sacrifice. And the last point that I want to talk to you about in, in our outline, but I'm going to invite our worship team to come to the platform here. As we talk about scars, it's important for us to come to a place where we feel that we can say this with confidence, that in my life there is pain that has a purpose. There is pain that has a purpose. That, that tells us sometimes there is pain that doesn't seem to have any purpose. It, it happens and, and like where is God and, and I don't learn anything about it. It, it seems like it, it has no purpose. And, and the truth is, is that there is something that I, I try to ration this out in my own mind theologically. And the place that I end up with, because we can get overcome with this whole thing. What is the purpose God? And he doesn't write it in the sidewalk or, or send a plane to put it in the air, or even send somebody. And sometimes when somebody thinks they've been sent to tell us the purpose, not so helpful. <laughs> Amen? But Romans eight twenty eight, And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, and who have been called according to what? His purpose. Notice, though, that the word there does not say that all things are good. We know that in all things, God works for the good, but it doesn't say, it doesn't say we know that for the people of God, all things are good. It also doesn't say that he's working that good out for me. It says for who? For the people of God. That means pain may come into my life for your good. I hate that. Why should I have to endure pain and you get something good? Or why should you have to endure pain so that I can reap some benefit? That doesn't seem right at all, but that's what the scripture is telling us. 
It may end up being someone else's good. Let's stand. Your scars have meaning too. Jesus did. Look at the scars in my hands. They were a symbol. They were a representation that the resurrection was true. That all the things he had tried to communicate happened as he said that they would. And your scars have meaning too. And if we're mindful of the how and the when, he will use them. Sometimes, sometimes we get stuck telling our, our scar stories over and over and over and over and over and over again. We got to be careful about that. God will use them if we're mindful. And they, they come out like seasoning about the story of our life rather than the whole story. I just want to say one last thing as we wrap up. There might be some people that want to come forward and make it two things. There might be some people that want to come forward and pray this morning about this. And I just would say to you, always our altar is open. We would surround you and pray with you. But the other thing is we come all the way back to Thomas's story. Don't hide in your pain. I, I have this feeling that Thomas avoided everybody that he could for that week. And then came back and shows up and Jesus is there. But I just, and if he didn't avoid them physically, he just was like, don't talk to me about that. We don't have any record of that. I just feel like he did. When he left the room that day, when they were all going, We've just seen Jesus and he couldn't participate in that. Like I said, either literally or figuratively, he left. And there's people that do that in the church all the time. I don't tell anybody. Part of it sometimes is because they don't want you to know. I would rather just hang out in, in, in my woundedness. I, I, that's what they think. And they go to another church. And the thing is, is your woundedness goes to that place too. It follows you. I, I just have this feeling that if, if Thomas would have even said something in that moment, it's really hard for me to be around all y'all when you are shouting and singing and excited because I missed all that and I just needed to say that. Would you pray for me? That could have been the beginning of restoration right there. He doesn't do that. And you know people who, who have acted just like he did. Praise the Lord though Jesus doesn't leave him there. Lord, we thank you this morning for meeting with us and for guiding and directing this service. And we just thank you for all that you are. And that you want to use the issues of our life and not just leave us drowning. And bring healing, particularly as it relates to our spirit. We pray these things in Jesus' name. more I see